This is actually a second part. We're continuing on from looking at the verses before 9, 8 and such. <laughs> uh, but basically the contrast between the person who is described by Paul as in the flesh, the unbeliever, and in the spirit, the believer, and all the things that they have. And, and basically Paul gives... Mostly the, the negative contrasts of the, the unbeliever, that they're in the flesh, that they have their mind set according to the flesh, um, that they think on fleshly things, they, they're spiritually dead, their mind set on the flesh is death, um, it cannot subject itself to the law of God, it's hostile to God, it's not able to please God, all these things. And, and in verse 9, he kind of goes back to the believer and talks about, and just that, contrast however you as the believer you are not in the flesh but in the spirit and then goes on to describe what we have in the spirit of god and the unique position that the believer is in or the contrast that the believer is in against the unbeliever who's described as in the flesh but anyway, so we'll get in and see more of that, those series of contrasts, but it just reminded me as we were studying this, just really seeing how this is the, the chapter of the, the Holy Spirit and the assurance of salvation and laying out at the beginning that there's, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because the spirit of life and peace has set you free from the law of sin and death. So. We're, we're saved in Christ because of that sacrifice for sin and because Christ through the Spirit has fulfilled the law in us and we no longer are condemned by the law, but the law guides us and teaches us as the Spirit indwells us and gives us a new nature. And so just, you know, as we I think we've acknowledged a lot of times, just going through verse by verse and understanding the theme of, uh, of Romans as it develops, and Paul talking about that the, the Holy Spirit really works toward our sanctification and understanding, at least for me, I think Romans 8 in a way that hadn't really understood it before um, because I kind of just put it in, okay, yeah, it's this chapter that deals with uh, justification by faith and a few other things, but I was like, and while that's true, I, I didn't realize how Paul had kind of gotten there and it's actually more about uh, because of that, Here's the, the role of the Holy Spirit and bring and guaranteeing our salvation and bringing our salvation and sanctification to uh, to completion. Um, but anyway, it reminded me of like in the early church in the first couple hundred years of the church as they were kind of struggling through the heresies that were coming up about the nature of Jesus and trying to define that. They they came up with uh, the Nicene Creed, which is a statement about Jesus having the same substance, the same nature as the Father. And so they make this, you know, this great biblical statement of faith, summary of this of the biblical faith, but they don't say that much about the Holy Spirit because that wasn't the controversy of the time, but they just kind of end off with I and I believe in the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and so that's basically how it ends. And they they add more um, a little bit later as they develop that creed a little further, but Charles Spurgeon, he would take that when he would preach and he would climb the stairs into the pulpit to preach God's word. He, with every step he'd be praying and he'd remind himself, I believe in the Holy Spirit, I believe in the Holy Spirit. And so we, I think it's, this is a great chapter for mm -hmm. illustrating uh, the, the importance of the role of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. and, and really also seeing the, the Trinitarian aspect of our salvation, as we'll see here tonight, that it's God is the one doing it and accomplishing it through Christ, through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, the work of Christ applied by the Holy Spirit to the believer. And so just to, by way of review again, so that we look at that the Spirit applies the, the guarantees and the realities of the gospel in verse 2, that's, that's freedom from the law or the principle of sin and death, fulfillment of the law through the work of Christ in verses 3 and 4, uh, a new mindset in verses 5 and 6, that the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the spirit is life and peace. Uh, assurance of life and peace in verse 6. 
friendship with God as opposed to hostility with God, ability to and desire to subject ourselves to the, the law of God and, and obey it. So the law is no longer threatening and condemning us, but it's guiding and teaching us. And the Holy Spirit gives us the desire to want to obey God's law and submit to and agree with God's word. And it gives us a willingness and a desire to obey God and the ability to please God because we're in Christ, we're justified, we're righteous before him, which is God's doing in Christ, that the law is fulfilled in us in Christ through the Holy Spirit. Now we have the ability to obey God and to please him, not to earn anything before God, but to live a life that is uh, dedicated to the Lord and in obedience to him. And uh, but the unbeliever, as is described here, is, is in the flesh, the realm uh, and rule of the sinful aspect of human nature that doesn't have to do with God. Uh, they are threatened and condemned by the law. Romans 8, 1 through 4 talks about this. They cannot understand spiritual things. Romans 8, 5, that the mindset on the flesh is death. They're spiritually dead. They're hostile to God. Romans 8, 7. Uh, they are unwilling to sub, uh, to be subject to the law of God. They are in. They're not just unwilling; that they're unable to subject themselves to the law of God, and they can't. Paul concludes in verse eight that those who are in the flesh cannot please God. It's impossible for somebody in the flesh, a sinner, to please God. And then he does the contrast that I read earlier, first verse for tonight. However, you, if you're a believer, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. That's the realm that we're in now. We're no longer categorized as being in the flesh, but being in the Holy Spirit. So what else, and we'll see here some key things that Paul points out, what else does the spirit of God provide to every believer? What promises, what realities uh, are belong to the believer and are, are true of every Christian? Uh, because of being in Christ. And so we'll see these, these three points and kind of work out here through the verses uh, 9, 10, and 11. Is we'll see the Spirit's indwelling, that we are in the realm of the Spirit, but that the Spirit dwells in us as in the believer. Uh, we see the application of Christ's internal life, that Jesus rose from the dead and that we are already spiritually resurrected from the dead. And then we're also, by because of the Holy Spirit, guaranteed uh, final resurrection of our body that our, that will conform to Christ as well so that even though we die physically unless the Lord returns we will be uh, resurrected so let's uh, get into these kind of points tonight in, in verse 9 the first point of what does the Holy Spirit what else does the Holy Spirit provide? And we see there first the, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is in us. And let's read uh, Romans 8, 9 together in its uh, entirety there. Romans 8, 9 says, However, you are not in the flesh, not in the realm of the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. In other words, every believer has the Spirit of God in them. The Spirit of God indwells them, that you are in the Spirit. So we're in the realm of the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is in us. So we, both of those realities are true. And Paul says that this is a defining mark of a Christian, of a believer, that if anybody does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him, meaning Everybody who belongs to Christ has the Spirit of Christ. And notice how Paul's language, as I said, this is very Trinitarian. Paul's language moves easily from the Spirit of God dwells in you. you, you have the, you're not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. The Spirit of God dwells in you. If anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, the, the, the inter-Trinitarian uh, language that he uses here of talking about that the Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of God, he's a person within the Trinity, but he's also the spirit of Christ. And so this indwelling, Jesus spoke about this in John 14 and other places, but John 14, 16 and 17. And this indwelling is something that is a line of demarcation. It's something that actually happened 
uniquely to uh, to New Testament believers and believers in this uh, this time period in a unique way. John fourteen sixteen and seventeen, uh, Jesus says, "I will ask the Father, and He will give you another Helper that He may be with you forever." That is the Spirit of Truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it does not know him, uh, because it does not see him or know him. But you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. Okay, so we see there again, Jesus is talking. He says, "I will ask the Father that He will send you another Helper, a Paraclete, one that comes alongside to help." And he says, this is a spirit of truth that you already know because he's been with you, but he will be in you. Meaning this is going to be a unique um, aspect of the Holy Spirit's ministry that will be a reality for every believer. So I believe the Holy Spirit, the, the Bible teaches the Holy Spirit is active in the salvation of every believer in the Old Testament and the New, mm. but the in unique indwelling of every believer in the New Testament way, I think that's something that's specifically uh, unique to the New Covenant and the New Testament scriptures uh, explaining that. So the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, because Jesus says that he, that he will be in you. And that's what Paul talks about here, that if the Spirit... Uh, of God dwells in you. And then Romans 8.10, as it will go on, it talks about because of the Holy Spirit, right? Christ is located in heaven. He's ascended to heaven, seated at God's right hand. But because of the presence of the Holy Spirit, Paul can even say in Romans 8.10, if Christ is in you, meaning Jesus is in us by virtue of uh, the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And then Romans 8.11 talks about, but if the spirit of him, of God, who raised Jesus from the dead, dwells in you. Okay, so this is the, the unique uh, indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And just to talk about how this was kind of looked forward to uh, in, in Old Testament times. Uh, can somebody read... Uh, well-known psalm, Psalm 51, verses 10 and 11, talking about David's repentance and kind of what he, what he prays and what he asks for. And we know these verses. We uh, sung these verses. You, you want to read it, Dan? Thank you. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Right. Now, as... Brett will rightly and quickly be point, uh, uh, able to point out that David's talking about his unique anointing as king with the Holy Spirit. But in David, in his psalm of, of repentance, um, that has been sung for 3,000 years, uh, he talks about, he, he says that his sin, as he confesses his sin, he recognized under, under the direction of the Holy Spirit as he writes this scripture, he says, you know what? The problem goes deeper. I need a, not just a change of attitude in general. I need a, a totally new heart. I need a new nature. I, I was born in sin, in iniquity. My mother conceived me in sin. I was brought forth. And basically, this isn't to extenuate me, but this is, this is to show just how deep my, my guilt goes. And so he asks, you know, which was an Old Testament theme of God having to give Israel... Uh, a new heart, a circumcised heart, a new nature that would be able to love God. David says that what has to happen in him is an act of God's creation. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. And then he says, basically because of his sin, David recognizes that just like Saul disobeyed God and had the Holy Spirit, the anointing of the king removed from him, David deserves the same thing that's happened to happen to him. And so he asks God, don't take away your Holy Spirit from me. But he also recognizes in Psalm 51, he says, you know, I sacrifice an offering you do not desire. Meaning for David's sin, conspiracy, murder, uh, adultery, there's not a sacrifice that he can just go offer and, and make it all right. Um, that he, his, the only payment for the sacrifice really should have been David's death. But God forgives him and allows him to live. And so kind of putting these themes together, 
you get the, the looking forward to the fulfillment in Christ, who is the true sacrifice for sin, who brings about the Holy Spirit uh, through the new covenant to, to renew us, creating us a clean heart. And now because of Christ and Christ's obedience, um, we have that permanent indwelling of the Holy Spirit. So that's where bread is, is absolutely right. We, we're, God's not going to take away the Holy Spirit from us. But that's not because of us. That's because of what's been accomplished in Christ, which is which David was recognizing. I, I wasn't able to obey God and fulfill what God God's role for me as king. Uh, but Jesus was able to do that. And so therefore, now we have uh, the ministry of the Holy Spirit. I'll read... Um, I'll read uh, Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34, where he talks about the, the new covenant, which we have aspects of in uh, us as, as New Testament believers. Jeremiah 31, 31, he says, Behold, this is the Lord talking, Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the old covenant which I made with their fathers on the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel in those days, declares the Lord. Now here's where he explains what he will do. I will put my law within them, and on their heart I will write it. So there will be an appreciation internally of God's law. I will be their God, and they will be my people, that intimacy with God. They will not teach again each man his neighbor and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. So Jeremiah says this will become a reality when God deals finally and completely with, uh, with sin, forgives sin completely. Um, Another prophet who talks about this a little bit is Ezekiel. And in Ezekiel's time, uh, God, there's a lot going on. Ezekiel focuses on God's temple and the fact that Israel is going to go into exile. But in Ezekiel's time, he points out that the temple is full of idols, that they're allowing idols into God's temple. And so God, through Ezekiel, gives this has him go preach and says, no, the problem goes deeper than just the fact that they're allowing idolatry in God's temple. And so it gives God's diagnosis. Um, can somebody give, uh, can somebody read Ezekiel 14.3? Kenton, you want to do that? 14.3. Yes. Ezekiel. Son of man, these men have taken their idols into their hearts and set the stumbling block of their iniquity before their faces. Should I indeed let myself be consulted by them? Right. So what's the deeper problem of idols? They're idols in the temple is rebellion against God, but what's the diagnosis of why there are idols in the temple? Yeah, because there's already idols in the individual temple of their hearts. So Ezekiel views individual people as temples as well but instead of being temples for god filled with god's present their presence they're full of idols idols of the heart somebody should write a book on that um yeah and i didn't it was a few years ago that i realized i'm like oh the bible actually uses that ter terminology right so um but Ezekiel looks ahead in Ezekiel 35 to, uh, 36 25 through 27 to the new covenant where God says then I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean and I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and idols I mean God will do a cleansing work to change the heart from idols verse 26 moreover I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you and I will remove the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh and then verse 27 key for tonight I will put my spirit within you and it will cause you to walk in my statutes and you will be careful to observe, uh, observe my ordinances. So God says that ultimately he will deal with Israel's sin by dealing with the, the idols in the temple of their heart. That he'll cleanse their heart, he'll give them a new heart and he'll fill them with his spirit. So this is key. So when Paul talks about here, you are in the spirit. If the spirit of God dwells in you, this is a huge deal, this indwelling uh, 
of the Holy Spirit. Ezekiel 37, 14 talks about this as well. God says, I will put my spirit within you and you will come to life. So there's resurrection, which will appear in this uh, text in Romans 8 as well, that paradigm. I will put my spirit in you and you will come to life and I will place you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and done it, declares the Lord. So there's this connection with the indwelling of God's spirit and resurrection from the dead. Um, and Eze how Ezekiel's theology works is he talks about God dealing with the individual temple and then the corporate temple, like the temple and the land. Uh, and then this would lead to God's worldwide uh, cosmic temple, which is also talked about in places like Isaiah 6, where the whole world, the whole earth is filled with God's glory. Um, and so if you restore the individual temple, that means you're on the way to uh, the fulfillment of that vision. Um, so Paul talks about this, this, so the people of God knew because God told them they need a new heart, they need resurrection from the dead, and they need this by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. That's what Paul talks about here. We have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. This, this uh, causes us to have a new heart, a new mindset. The mindset on the Spirit is life and peace. And that, uh, that if anyone belongs to Christ, he has the Spirit of Christ. And Paul also, uh, in can somebody read uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20? This is a, another familiar verse or set of verses. From Awana. Some more temple language. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, 6, 19, 20 says, Don't you know that your body is a sanctuary of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. Right. So that's where Paul takes... I think a lot of the Old Testament theology, particularly Ezekiel, and says, since, you know, if God dwells somewhere and makes his presence evident somewhere, that place is usually considered like a temple, like the tabernacle or the dwelling of God in the temple in the Old Testament. But now Paul says that, going by the paradigm of Ezekiel, your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit because God, through the Spirit, dwells in you. Right, and that you're not your own. You belong to, uh, you belong to God. One, because He created us. Two, because He redeemed us in Christ. And then three, because He indwells us with the Holy Spirit. That our our body is a, supposed to be a temple, where the, we're supposed to not have idols and sin and other things that would be appropriate, inappropriate in a temple for God, but to be a holy dwelling for. The Holy Spirit, and he, he says in verse twenty, "For you have been bought with a price, Christ sacrificed. Therefore, glorify God with your body. Our bodies are supposed to be temples." Uh, and then we're also, Paul talks about in Ephesians two, and Peter talks about in First Peter two that we're we're stones, uh, we're individual temples, but we're like stones building up a a living temple in the the whole church, which is a uh, place for God's worship through Christ, offer acceptable sacrifice of worship. And then Paul will talk about this later in Romans 12, 1, 2, where he uses temple language, where he talks about present your bodies as a living sacrifice, that if we're a temple, one of the things that happens in temples is sacrifice, continue to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. So there's this temple language it also goes along with having a renewed mind, that because you have that mind set, that the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the spirit is life and peace, because we now can have uh, a new heart uh, through the Holy Spirit, and the, the permanent indwelling of the Holy Spirit, we can renew our mind and offer ourselves in obedience as a living sacrifice to God. So that's the first aspect there in verse 9, that, uh, that we are in the spirit, if the Spirit of God dwells in you, so that indwelling of the Holy Spirit, and then the, the statement of truth or warning, but if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. Meaning someone cannot be a Christian who does not have, uh, have the Holy Spirit. Then how do you know if somebody has the Holy Spirit? 
How do they respond to God? How do they respond to the law of God? Do they, how do they respond to sin? Do they agree with God about sin and his assessment of sin? And are they struggling against sin? And actually that awareness of sin is not, um, or that consciousness of sin is not a bad thing. It's an, it's an evidence of a, a believer, that awareness that, wow, we still have sin. Um, but Paul's going to continue to talk about that and say that's going to be a reality in, in believers. Um, but not forever. Eventually we'll be redeemed uh, and, and be sinless. But let's look at verse 10, that the Holy Spirit not only provides that indwelling, but also applies the, uh, the internal life of Christ. The internal life of Christ is applied to us. And verse 10 says, if Christ is in you, Again, see the language there of that now through the Spirit, Christ can be said to be in us. If Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the Spirit is alive because of righteousness. Okay, Because Christ is in you through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, even though our bodies are still subject to sin, and the effects of sin is death and decay, like our bodies we get hurt, we get sick, we sin, and we have internal corruption still. And unless the Lord returns while we're still living in our body, we will, uh, we will die. Our body is dead because of sin and still experiencing the effects of the fall. But in contrast, our spirit is alive because of righteousness. That in, in that sense, our spirit's already been resurrected with Christ, like Paul talks about in Ephesians, that you've been, that he's already resurrected and seated in heavenly places, but uh, God made us alive together with Christ and seated us with him in heavenly places. So spiritually, our resurrection has already taken place. We're spiritually resurrected and seated with Christ, but our body is still dying. Our body is still subject to sin and death in this world. And so, uh, just to kind of fill this out a little bit, uh, our inner man has the life of God. Romans 8, 6 talks about, for the mind set on the flesh is death, meaning that's spiritual death. Ephesians 2, 1 talks about before people were saved. Paul talks about, and you were, or being dead in your trespasses and sins, meaning you're spiritually dead insensitive, unable to respond to the things of God. Um, Ephesians 2, 5, and 6, uh, kind of quoted earlier, that says, even when we were dead in our transgressions, so we were dead spiritually in our sins, and we would have died physically and eternally, it says, uh, God made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. God's power to accomplish that. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that's that union with Christ. So since we're in our salvation united with Christ, he's already risen from the dead. Spiritually, we're already risen from the dead. And even though locationally, we're still here in our body, spiritually in our status, we're seated with Christ in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And so there's that great doctrine of the, the union with Christ again. So we're, we're already united to him. And that's good news because that means in a sense, and Romans 8 talks about this, the believer and you as a believer are already as saved as you're ever going to be. So you can't be any more saved. You can't be any more justified. Uh, we will experience the, the full effects and the consequences of glorification, but we actually can't be any more uh, glorified either. It's already taken place in terms of our status. That's already there. And the evidence of that, Paul talks about, is the, the Holy Spirit, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. He talks about this in Ephesians 1, 13 and 14, that uh, after having uh, believed the message of the, of the truth, you were indwelled with the Holy Spirit, who is our guarantee um, or down payment. Of, so the Holy Spirit is the guarantee that we are united with Christ, that we have his internal life, that we're already resurrected, that we're already seated with him in heavenly places, 
Um, and then Ephesians 1, 19 through 23 talks about where Christ is seated. It talks about uh, these, the promises. Uh, these are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but in the age to come. And he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him, which fills all in all. So since Christ is the head and the church is his body and Ephesians is about the, the status, the placement spiritually of the church, the church of the Christ, um, Christ is seated there and the believer is in that position there with Christ as well in our status. Uh, and we'll experience that in eternity, in, uh, in our reality as well. Um, going back to Romans 6.4, talks a little bit about this as well. It talks about, uh, therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death. So that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. So this has already happened. We've, we've, in our status, we've died with Christ. In our status, we've also been raised with Christ, and now we can walk in newness of life through the Holy Spirit. Uh, and then Paul also talks about this, that we have the life of Christ in us, who are spiritually alive in Christ, in Galatians 2.20, that I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I have lived, and then that key phrase, but Christ lives in me, that that's where our internal spiritual life comes from. Christ lives in me, how? Through the Holy Spirit. Mm. And the life that I now live by uh, mm. uh, in the flesh, our body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. And then uh, going back again to uh, Romans 7, 4, just to see this filled out a little bit more, talks about, therefore, my brethren, you were also made to die to the law through, one, through the body of Christ, so we're dead to the law in Christ, so that you might be joined to another, to him who was raised from the dead in order that we may bear fruit for God. And in our status now, we're dead to the law, but we are alive, joined, united, and alive to Christ. So now the law no longer has that role of threatening and condemning us, and we can actually bear fruit for God uh, in Christ through uh, God's Spirit. Okay, so that's, that's all good and great, uh, but what about our bodies? And that's what Paul deals with in uh, verse 11, that this is a, a total salvation that it, you know, it's kind of funny. Um, I was thinking about today, back to when I took a test in order to uh, sub and to teach, and you had to take this subject level, like competency test, uh, called the the C set, and it was this test on history, and it asked this question that says that Paul of the New Testament was influenced by which Greek philosopher? And I knew the answer was wrong, but I had read this before and knew where they, what they were getting at. And they wanted me to say, and I had to say it, even though this was incorrect. Um, I mean, at least not influenced in the way that they were thinking. Influenced maybe in the world of you know, terms and stuff, but not, not like that. But they wanted me to say he was influenced by Plato. Uh, which Plato, remember, is... is full-on, like, uh, rationalist and Greek dualism, that he thinks, okay, the real world is not the physical, it's the world of the forms, that's where the real reality resides, and this physical world is, is bad, and we should be freed from it to experience the spiritual world, um, which Paul talks about that as well. He talks about the physical world, he talks about the spiritual, okay, the Christ, even though our bodies are dead because of sin, we're alive because of righteousness, but... This next verse totally refutes that idea that Paul follows like a platonic or a Greek dualist view of, well, the spiritual is good and the physical is bad. In fact, Christianity in general, Christ is, is God in the flesh. So, I mean, it, it totally refutes that anyway. Um, but 
It is fair to say, though, I think that uh, Platonism did influence, in a bad way, Christianity, where people started in an unbiblical way to, to discount the importance of the world that God has created and the role of our bodies because they didn't holistically view things like this. So yes, we're alive in our spirit, we're resurrected, but Paul also talks about that through the spirit, Christ's resurrection will be applied to, uh, to our bodies. Look at verse 11. It says, but if, and again, notice how Trinitarian this is, but if the spirit of him, God, who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Okay, so that this is a holistic salvation of not just a disembodied existence, but God will uh, redeem the body as well and conform the body through resurrection to the body uh, like Christ's in his glory. So Jesus died in his body and was re resurrected from the dead bodily. And our life and final resurrection is not not disembodied. I choose that, choose that word carefully. It's not separate from our body. Um, now, Paul can say things like to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, right? So when we when we die, yes, we're we're already seated with Christ spiritually in heavenly places. We're we're with the Lord, but we also wait for. And I think this is where Christians kind of forget the the kind of full part of this story that we're waiting for the resurrection of our glorified bodies. So the Holy Spirit doesn't just apply the life of God through Christ to our spirit. Well, that's true. That's in Romans 8.10. But it will apply it to our body in raising us from the dead like Christ as well. He'll give life to our mortal bodies. And so we have the guarantee of that right now. We're already resurrected. We're already spiritually alive. Um, but we will be resurrected from the dead. Uh, and the Spirit is God's mechanism of applying our union with Christ regarding the resurrection. So that's why it's like, well, just because Jesus rose from the dead, well, what does that have to do with me? Well, we're united to Christ. And how, what, what's one of the key ways we're united? We have Christ's Spirit that raised him from the dead. Therefore, he will raise uh, us from the dead as well. Um, and there's... A bunch of aspects of verses that say God raised Jesus from the dead, like here in Romans 1, 3, and 4. There's verses like John 10, 17, 18, where Christ says he raises himself from the dead. I have authority to lay my life down. I have authority to take it up again. And then there's verses that indicate that the Spirit was also involved in raising Christ from the dead. Um, and then it's, it's true for all of us, too, that God will raise us from the dead. Christ talks about in... John 6, I think it's like 645, he says, I, and I will raise him up. I, I, of all the Father has given to me, I lose none, and I will raise him up on the last day. So Christ and John 5 also talks about that, uh, that those who sleep will hear the voice of the Son of Man and will be resurrected. Um, and then the Holy Spirit here will give life to our mortal bodies. So the Trinity will be at work in our uh, in our resurrection, just as in the rest of our salvation. Um, and then in other words, we're united to Christ through the Spirit, and because he died and rose from the dead, so will we. Let's go back to Romans uh, 6, 3 through 5, indicates this as well. It says, Or do you not know that all those who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? That's what our baptism represents. Uh, and they were joined with him in his death. Uh, therefore, we've been buried with him through baptism to death. So just as Christ was great, raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For, we, for if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, we've already died with Christ, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. So in other words, if we've died with Christ, 
uh, we'll also live with Christ. We've already spiritually died with Christ. That's our status. We also spiritually live with Christ. Christ physically died and rose from the dead. We will physically die and rise from the dead as well. Um, and that's what Ezekiel uh, 37 was talking about as well. That uh, let me just go back to that real quick, right? Had that because that was a. 37, 14, I will put my spirit in you and you will come to life. And Ezekiel 37 is the vision where Ezekiel has, sees the field full of bones and God tells him to preach the bones and tell them to come alive. And so Ezekiel does, which would be impossible, but the Holy Spirit comes and brings them to life, but they're technically not alive until the Spirit fills them, and then they come to life, and God says, this is the house of Israel. So it shows that he's going to resurrect them from the dead. In, in terms of the Old Testament, God says, you're going to go in and die in exile, but on, I will raise you from the dead. Uh, and then he says, but I'll also fill you with my Spirit. So that when those things are happening, indicated mainly by Christ's resurrection first, and then the indwelling of the Holy Spirit shows that God is uh, bringing about um, the aspects of the new covenant. So Ezekiel 37 has to do with resurrection. Uh, Daniel also indicates uh, the resurrection of death and resurrection of the Messiah and the saints. He talks about in Daniel 9.26, it talks about Messiah, the prince, will be cut off, be, uh, but not for himself. So die for, uh, for others. Uh, but Daniel 7, 13, and 14 talks about the Son of Man reigning over God's kingdom forever and everybody coming to worship him, and the saints reigning uh, because of solidarity with him. Okay, so it's like, well, how can the Messiah be said to die in one chapter and be said to reign forever? Well, because of resurrection. And uh, Daniel 12, 2 indicates this as well. It talks about that... Uh, that talks about the resurrection to judgment and talks about the resurrection to life of the saints. And so in Daniel, the saints and the, and the Messiah are connected so that what happens to one has happened to the other. So if the Messiah dies and then reigns forever and the saints die and then they reign forever and the saints are resurrected, it indicates that uh, the Messiah has resurrected as well. Um, so the ultimate hope of eternity for the Christian is not just to go be a spirit in heaven, but to be resurrected with a glorified body uh, likened after Christ. Uh, let me read Ephesians 3.21, uh, where Paul talks about this. He says, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory by the exertion of the power that he has even to subject all things to himself. And then 1 John 3, 2 talks about that it hasn't appeared as yet what we will be, but we know that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him just as he is. Uh, and then just to finish up here, look at a little later in Romans 8, uh, 23, which we'll get to later on talks about, and not only this, it talks about when God redeems, uh, manifests the, the, his completed work on earth that starts with our salvation. Actually, I'll start in 22. It says, for we know the whole creation groans and suffers under the pains of childbirth together until now. So creation subjected to this uh, the, the realm and, and rule of sin. And says, and now, uh, in verse 23, and now, not only this, but we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, having the Holy Spirit in us and longing for the future glorification, even we groan within ourselves, waiting eager, eagerly for our adoption as sons. Notice that last phrase, the redemption of our body. Okay, so that's what he talks about, that the Holy Spirit indicates that there will be that redemption of our body, that that's ultimately what we're waiting for in our glorification, and that that's uh, what Romans 8.28 talks about, that we know all these things uh, because of the Holy Spirit, that we know God causes all things to work together for good, to those who are called, uh, who those who are 
love God and who are called according to his purpose. And then it talks about how we know these things. Um, in verses 29 30 that for those whom he foreknew he predestined to become conformed to the image of his son which will be done in our spirit and our resurrected body uh, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren for those whom he predestined he also called those whom he called he also justified and those whom he justified he also glorified that's the final redemption of our body without sin without imperfection, without weakness, without death, without pain. And so we'll be conformed to the image of his son, and it's guaranteed, since Paul talks about justification, and that's guaranteed in chapters really 3 through 5. Paul says in Romans 8.30, all those he justified, he also glorified, and even in the past tense, that it's already guaranteed as far as God is concerned. And so this is why the resurrection of Jesus, one of the reasons, is, is so central to the gospel. Um, because the Christian is already positionally resurrected with Christ and united to him. Uh, but if we ever wondered, okay, well, how is God going, how is the resurrection of our body going to take place? Well, here it is in verse 11. The spirit of God is going to, to resurrect those uh, who, the same one who raised Jesus from the dead is going to give life to our mortal bodies because he he indwells us. So Paul says, okay, the Holy Spirit gives you all this, the, the guarantee of our salvation, um, the spiritual life of Christ internally, the, the hope of future resurrection, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. If all this is true, so what? What do we do? Well, Paul gets kind of into the application then in verses 12 and 13, which we'll look at next time. He says, so then, brother, and we are under obligation, meaning we're, we have a debt that we owe to God now. Uh, we are under obligation, but not to the flesh. We're no longer enslaved to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. The wages of sin is death. But... If by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. In other words, the Holy Spirit now enables us to um, start putting to death sin as we live in a, in a continual struggle of sin uh, where the victory is guaranteed because of Christ. So that'll be our application. We'll get a little bit deeper into that next week and talk about, okay, how does that work? How do we... How do we kill sin? How do we fight sin? How do we do this through the power of the Holy Spirit? Um, and we can talk about that a little bit, uh, kind of in, infer that a little bit tonight. Um, but those, it's only knowing those truths of what the Holy Spirit does and what the Holy Spirit provides and the realities of the gospel that are true of every believer that we go about killing sin, that we recognize we're not obligated to the flesh anymore. We don't have to follow the dictates of our sin and the flesh and the devil and our sinful thoughts and sinful desires. We are under obligation to God that, therefore, since you've been bought with a price, glorify God with your body or the temple of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and we're supposed to work with the Holy Spirit to put to death the deeds of the body, the, the uh, sin of the body and, and our, our flesh. Uh, and that struggle is what indicates uh, being in Christ and being in the Spirit. So let's, uh, let's close in a word of prayer and ask, uh, ask the Lord through the Spirit to help us uh, apply these things and to um, really think strategically about how we can mature in killing sin through the power of the Spirit. Lord God, we thank you for uh, the truth of your word that is inspired by the Spirit. Lord, we thank you for sending Christ, that you accomplished all these realities in him. We thank you for the union with Christ that is applied by the Spirit, that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, and that all these things, that Christ's life, the indwelling of the Spirit, the hope of future resurrection is all made a reality by your Spirit. Lord, we pray that you would cause us to have a greater consciousness 
an awareness of your spirit that uh, that you would convict us of uh, thinking and acting uh, as if your spirit does not indwell us and of trying to uh, live as if that were not true and of quenching the Holy Spirit through our our sin and insensitivity. Lord, we pray that we would uh, try to, uh, in a greater way, fulfill being a temple of the Holy Spirit and who dwells in us because we have been uh, bought with a price. Lord, we pray that you would um, cause us to uh, glorify you in our bodies. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.